When comparing the Sly Cooper trilogy, the one I quickly point to without a second thought in regards to which one is my least favorite is Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves, which first released on the PlayStation 2 on September 26th of 2005. I have had an interesting history with this game, going from playing it often as a kid, replaying it when they did the HD collection in 2010, realizing it was my least favorite, hating it, gaining more respect for it for obvious reasons, and ending with, I love Sly 3, but it's my least favorite. The worst of the best, the return of the Jedi effect, if that makes it clear what I'm talking about. It's got some fantastic elements and wraps the series up, but also stumbles in ways I didn't think Sly 1 or 2 did. However, for a large portion of Sly Cooper fans, Sly 3 is the favorite. Picking which of the four Sly games is a person's favorite is almost always a battle between Sly 2 and Sly 3, with it often being a battle between Sly 1 and Sly 4 for which one takes last place. As I've mellowed out as a person, I can't say I really care to see one game win out over another. Today, I'm not here to tell you why Sly 3 is the worst game in the trilogy with an hour and 11 minutes worth of examples. I have no such agenda. Now, I will still mention some things I didn't like in Sly 3, as I still would pick it as my least favorite of the three, but instead, I just want to do what I do in all my recent videos. Just focus on my experience with the subject, the stories I have with it, and what I like and don't like, and how the stories of its creation impact my experience. Those tend to be the biggest factors of my best videos, I find. To explore what makes Sly 3 so great, I see no better way to begin than its creation, which was done in a unique fashion compared to Sly 1 and Sly 2. Sly 3 had what was, at the time, and probably still is, the fastest development cycle of any game produced by Sucker Punch. Sly 1 was in development for three years, and Sly 2 was done in two years. With this game being released just one year after Sly 2, that means they only got about 10 or 11 months to build an entire 10-hour game before it had to ship. This also being a smaller development team than a lot of AAA studios at the time. So it sounds like a daunting task, and I suppose it is, but they had their reasons. The PS3 was due to launch in 2006, so I'd imagine they wouldn't want to work on a PS2 game for that year, nor launch Sly 3 on PS3 when the whole series was so at home on PS2. That's merely speculation on my end, though. What we do know is that Sly 3 was more of a fun challenge for the team. How much can we accomplish in under a year? A challenge to look back on fondly to this day. When diving into the game, I can see why they had that confidence in their ability to pull it off, because Sly 3 shows that Sucker Punch were masters of their Sly craft at this point. The animated cutscenes are the best in the series, with more movement in the characters than ever before, while still maintaining the feel of a graphic novel. The characters are consistently on model, unlike a few bits of Sly 2 where the poses might look a little weird and the proportions might get screwy. Sly has six fingers here, I challenge you to unsee that. None of those issues are present in Sly 3 as the production value has been raised across the board. The visuals popping much more in Sly 3 as the characters all appear more vibrant and saturated. The developers worked hard on the particle effects to give the combat, for example, a cartoony feel. Just compare Sly's cane swipe in Sly 1 and Sly 2 to Sly 3 and you'll see what I mean. Several areas will come with day and night settings with different skyboxes and lighting conditions throughout the streets. The in-engine cutscenes haven't seen much of a boost from Sly 2, still just relying on poses they reuse over and over again alongside gameplay animations, which will look really stiff when you see Sly walking, for example. But I still think that from a production standpoint, Sly 3 shows that Sucker Punch is getting the most out of the PS2 that they could, taking everything they had learned thus far into account to really up their game visually. Their mastery of pacing and intrigue is evident throughout the prologue as Sly and Bentley alongside five mystery characters are raiding Kane Island, the home of the fabled Cooper Vault. The location that Sly's ancestors had placed their vast storage of wealth and treasure. Sly obviously looking to collect. I had played Sly 1 and 2 before this, so you go in expecting this big job that's going to end with a chase with Carmelita and a getaway, but this game maximizes the suspense in that the setting is totally different from anything we've seen before. The Cooper gang suddenly has a bunch of new members, and all this is happening while the player's main question starting the game would just be what happened to the Cooper gang after Sly 2? Evidently a lot. The vault is about to open as you get introduced to the new main villain, Dr. M, who owns the deed to the island and has been trying to get inside the vault for years, but only a Cooper cane can do it. The prologue ends on the note of Sly about to be eaten alive by Dr. M's monsters, but then get the context. Sly 3 is one of those, yeah, that's me, you might be wondering how I got into this position kind of stories. It's explained that following Sly 2, Bentley was permanently paralyzed from the waist down, and Murray feels guilty for what happened and quit the team entirely, while Sly comes to learn of the Cooper Vault from a member of his father's gang who's currently doing time. Bentley learning to overcome his limitations by building the most super-powered wheelchair you've ever seen, complete with rocket boosters and bombs. It's pretty cool. Sly and Bentley realize that they alone don't have what it takes to overcome Dr. M and his massive operation on Kane Island, so they knew they needed to grow their ranks if they wanted to make a play for the Cooper Vault, setting up Sly 3. Getting inside the place would take precision, creativity, and moreover, it would take an army of world-class thieves. Finding and bringing together that much talent won't be easy, but to get inside the Cooper Vault and collect my inheritance, I was willing to pay the price. Thank <laughs> you.
Which brings us right into the gameplay as the first objective in the story is for Sly and Bentley to track down Murray and bring him back into the team. Sly 3 follows the same gameplay model as Sly 2. Each episode takes place in a different location as Sly, Bentley, and Murray do different missions to set up a grand heist at the end of the level, requiring all their combined skills to get a task accomplished. At the start of the game, I'd say Sly pretty much plays exactly like he did in Sly 2, only a couple of tiny changes like Sly's uppercut being restricted to stealth segments and made an unlockable for regular combat. That kind of thing, you know, very minute and tiny details. But overall, Sly is very consistent with how he was in Sly 2. The biggest improvement between games was how Bentley and Murray handle. Bentley, as I said, operates in his super-powered wheelchair, something they knew was going to happen at the end of Slide 2 pretty early on. Maybe somebody in the audience can confirm this for me, but I'm imagining it would be really cool for a kid in a wheelchair to play this game and get to be a badass character who is also in one as well. A character who is now, I'd argue, more badass in the chair than he was in Slide 2. I wasn't kidding, Bentley has fully tricked the thing out, first getting these rocket boosters upon double jumping that can be upgraded into a quadruple jump with a hover. He drops bombs much faster and he can now pickpocket guards by using his coin magnet. Because of Bentley's new hovering capabilities that are offered from the start of Sly 3, getting around as him is much easier than it was in Sly 2. So the issue of Sly being the only character that's fun to navigate areas as is removed entirely since upper paths and shortcuts are easily reached as Bentley and he can pickpocket guards too, just in his own way. While retaining all the things he could do in the last game like putting enemies to sleep with his sleep darts and dropping bombs from a distance. He's a real powerhouse in this one, but still doesn't take that honor away from Murray, who has also received quite an upgrade in this game. Getting around as him was the worst of the three in Sly 2, and they've improved that wholesale in Sly 3. Arguably, he's the most fun character to traverse the areas as. In Sly 3, Murray is a student of the Dreamtime Arts, which gives him the ability to roll into a ball and launch into the air upon hitting the ground. And if you press X right as you land, you'll go even higher into the sky, this going on for as long as you keep pressing the button. Getting to see the levels from this high up and also having this timed button press be correlated to how high you go in the air makes the basic act of running around as Murray really satisfying, as I can't think of anywhere he can't launch up to. He can also pickpocket guards as well just by picking them up and shaking their loose coins out of their pockets. The only trade-off being that stronger enemies take more hits to defeat in this one, unlike Sly 2 where Murray just obliterated everything in two hits, which I will gladly take for these upgrades and how he functions. For the most part, I think Sly 3's hubs are smaller than the ones in Sly 2, but they feel bigger to me because they're divided up into different sections. Sly 2 maps, as I said, revolved around singular focal points like the peacock sign in Episode 1 or the prison in Episode 4. In Sly 3, if you look at the map of Episode 1, for example, the left side of the map is where the giant police station dome is located, right next to the giant Octavio sign. But on the other side of the map, you have the Rialto Bridge and Octavio's Opera House. Episode 3, having one-fourth of the map be the hotel area, another fourth of the fields, the airplane garages next to that, and finally the Black Baron's castle in another corner. Making it extremely difficult to get lost, since each part of the hub world stands out visually from the other spots. That comes in handy too, because Sly 3's maps lack the exploration you could get from Sly 2's. This game removed clue bottles and safes from the maps, as well as treasures you could collect in exchange. Clue bottles I can take or leave, but the treasure was a big loss in my eyes. I say that because buying upgrades is still a major part of Sly 3. In the last game, I bought upgrades I thought were the most useful, but that just means that a lot of them, like Bentley's Health Extractor or Sly's Stealth Slide, are just not going to be purchased. Sly 3 still has a lot of those, but they made pretty much all the upgrades fun to use. The added visual flair helps, like Bentley's Rocket Boost on the ground or Sly's Rocket Shoes and the Shadow Powers, but also, Sly can upgrade his Cane Attacks to charge up to a third level to unleash devastating spin attacks, charge attacks, and jump attacks that just destroy enemies and bosses. However, the player's only way of getting coins in Sly 3 for almost the entire game is by pickpocket grinding, which only yields about 100 coins at a time, so you have to choose wisely what upgrades you want to buy when you'd want almost all of them. Combine that with how you also have required upgrades like the grapple cam sprung on you, you just don't feel like you should buy a lot of upgrades for fun since you don't usually have that many coins in this game. But luckily, the best upgrades that expand your mobility are unlocked from the start, so you don't have to worry about those. Murray's new abilities make it so there are more missions the developers can use him in, beyond the beat him up and escort missions they'd repeat in Sly 2. Now, he's got missions akin to those in Sly 3, but might also need to use his bounce move to take out tar drums from high above, or use it to sneak by lasers he'd get hit by if he stood up. Variety is something Sly 3 wears on its sleeve, and in both this playthrough and my last playthrough in 2021, I've realized that this was a major win for Sly 3 over Sly 2, when I used to see it as Sly 3's biggest con. Your mileage may vary on this, but for a lot of players, Sly 2 starts feeling monotonous by the end as each episode reuses a lot of the same missions over and over, like pickpocketing as Sly or beating up enemies as Murray. In Sly 3, the tasks of the gang members themselves are given more variety, as Sly in three of the episodes has to make use of disguises to navigate around areas. So a few missions will be dedicated to that. Other missions might use his photography skills outside of the need for basic recon like Sly 2. 
Bentley gets new gimmicks like his talent for art decryption locking and the grapple cam that he uses to survey areas and lure guards with. All these new mission types feel at home in the structure set up by Sly 2. It just makes it so that you don't do the same thing too often, though. I mean, Sly 2 had like 18 hacking minigames that often reused the same map with more enemies again and again. But in Sly 3, you only do it like 6 times and each map is distinct. The levels themselves also come with more platforming like this sewers bit as Sly in Episode 3 or the cave exploration missions as Sly and Murray in Episode 2. As if that wasn't good enough, the Cooper Gang expands its roster by 4 members by the end of the game. The new characters are side portions compared to the main trio, but what I like is that they provide their own twist on Sly gameplay that the game continues to build and challenge throughout. The Guru begins by riding on the backs of guards to bash obstacles in Episode 2, which grows into chasing down targets in Episode 3, and ends with hopping from shark to shark in the middle of the ocean in Episode 6. Penelope gets all the RC missions relegated to her as the difficulty curve grows in a similar manner to the Guru. This mission with carefully avoiding lasers of the RC car in Episode 4 being one of my favorites. I also love Dimitri's segments as he has one swimming mission that's quiet and atmospheric, but tense due to all the sharks surrounding you. But then another swimming mission that's a real test of your reaction time as you quickly dodge obstacles. Carmelita also gets into the mix as a playable character in dedicated shooting levels. But even that doesn't cover how much variety is in Sly 3. There are speedboat chases, biplane duels, and an entire pirate ship game of traveling the ocean and raiding other pirate ships for treasure in Episode 5. It's an entirely fleshed out sub-game with ranks depending on your total wrecked ship count, strategy in that opposing ships are weakest in the front and the back, decision making in that sinking a ship will net you less coins than raiding it when it's about to go under, all just sitting inside of a full level with platforming and other minigames. This being the best way to get coins in Sly 3 for those who were curious. Sly 1 was criticized most for being too short, and so Sly 2 was much longer. That game was critiqued for lacking in replay value, so Sly 3 is bursting at the seams with content while also being as long as Sly 2 in its campaign, if not longer. Then, giving you a bunch of things to do in the post-game like replaying missions, doing ranked challenges, replaying missions with these red and blue 2000 3D goggles, and playing the game's multiplayer. If you wanted to, Sly 3 is a game that could last you a while, and that would come from more than just replaying the campaign like Sly 2. Of course, Sly 3 doesn't have a perfect roster of missions. Whenever replaying this game, I always groan when I get to this crane game in Episode 2, or the sewers in Episode 3, or the Cooper Hangar Defense, also in Episode 3. The non-tent minigames in Sly 3 are easily the worst parts of the entire thing. Segments of brainlessly mashing buttons to get through easy segments that go on a really long time. Moments like these are the ones that stick out the most when I think back on why Sly 3 is my least favorite in the trilogy, because Sly 1 and 2, even in its most minigame of minigame segments, never felt this dull. The Panda King being an entire playable character who meets the criteria to be labeled non-tent, as you just point at enemies and hold down the aim and fire button for what feels like 10 minutes. At least his second mission feels a little more active as you have to make sure the ship doesn't sink, but the first mission was as dull as it gets. Although, in the grand scheme of things, I think Sly 3's minigames were an absolute win, since I can only think of three truly bad examples in a sea of fun variety that prevents the game from ever coming close to being stale. Sly 3 really went all out in terms of set pieces and ideas. Sly 2 reused countries and guards between episodes as each one was only about an hour long, so they wanted to get as much out of the villains and story as possible. But Sly 3 made each level last for 90 minutes to 2 hours, packing them full of unforgettable set pieces like raiding Octavio's house from the basement all the way to the computer room, or the Cooper gang taking over the lemonade bar from the miners or the aforementioned biplane duels. Taking every last drop of inspiration they had and pouring it into the game. An entire level based on pirate ships, a boss fight where you fly above bamboo, the game has it all. That makes it very easy for me to see why Sly 3 is the favorite for so many people. It has so much diverse content as a really epic feeling game with constant action. Like I said, I no longer have an agenda to tear this game down. I think it's awesome. I just happen to prefer Sly 1 and 2. Like, Sly 1 is the 9.5, Sly 2 is the perfect 10, and Sly 3 is the 9.0. I've got nothing against this one besides the small issues, but I think it's still goaded overall. Which just leaves the story in writing. I'll say up front, Sly 3 is the story that, as far as structure is concerned, is my least favorite of the three. I mean to say that Sly 2's narrative just sucked me into the world of the game when I was a kid. There were twists and turns around every corner that even the critics at the time thought was really well handled. The overarching narrative that unfolded from one episode to the next is peak Sly Cooper structure, if you ask me. Even in Sly 1, which is far simpler as a story than Sly 2, was all about Sly's personal mission to reclaim his birthright from five fiendish felons. The basic arc and level-to-level -level structure also keeps me invested. Sly 3 is one that, looking at it from a surface-level perspective, seems the most disconnected. The closest you get into an overarching story is that you release Dimitri from jail in Episode 1 and then make a deal with him in Episode 3 that you'll help him later, which happens in Episode 5 as he joins the team as a diver at the end. Overall, each episode of Sly 3 is pretty self-contained, following a basic pattern. 
The Cooper gang will see an opportunity to grow their ranks, but in order to do that, they need to complete a task on behalf of the person who will join, or in Murray's case, rejoin the team. So there's no big villain team up in Sly 3 or episode cliffhangers that will leave you begging to play more. To the point where you might actually lose sight of the goal the game is building up to, which is using this larger team to open the Cooper Vault, since everything that actually happens within the levels has nothing to do with that. Each level just opens up with this person's skills will help us with the Cooper Vault job, and here's what they want, so we have to go do it. A largely episodic structure is, like I was saying, not how I'd structure a Sly game if I were in the writer's room, but I'm also not a screenwriter, so I wouldn't be in the writer's room anyway. So while it's not the idea I'd come up with, I'd say it was worth a shot after the plots of the previous games, and I'd also say it worked quite well, because now the game has to stand up on the legs of its character writing alone, and it's here that Sly 3 really shines. For starters, I think Sly 3 is easily the funniest game in this series. They know these characters and what people like about them, so you just get them bouncing off each other's energy and the result is really entertaining. Alright boys, look tough and get angry. It's time to intimidate the locals. I'm not sure I can do it! How do you guys get angry? Find the match deep inside yourself. Light it! And let the fire burn up your guts and boil your blood! Uh, yeah, I pretty much do the same thing. And you just have characters tossing out good one-liners whenever they get the chance. And I don't just mean the main characters, just the way the villains speak so dramatically in highs and lows gets a chuckle out of me. And that includes NPCs too. Bentley steals the show when it comes to the funniest moments in the game. No better example than his confrontation with Mugshot in the hotel in Episode 3. You know, I've been thinking about your appearance. Look, if you don't got nothing to say nice, then don't say nothing at all. Get it? What? Ain't got no sassy comments, smart guy? Oh, I get it. You got nothing nice to say, so you're keeping quiet. That's real cute. You really got nothing nice to say? That's cold. Your mother was a broken down tub of junk with more gentlemen callers than the operator. While Sly 3 provides players with a decent supply of laughs, the thing that ties everything in Sly 3 together is its themes, because I think Sly 3 is the most thematically rich game in the Sly Cooper series. This is something I spent some time going over in my last look at this game five and a half years ago. The fact that Sly 3 is all about accepting change and letting go of the past and growing as a result of it. This is a theme in every stage of the game, so let's start from the beginning. The Cooper gang was pretty devastated by what happened in their mission to destroy Clockwork in Sly 2, so they begin the game fractured. In Episode 1, Murray has fully committed himself to the Dreamtime arts under his mystic teacher because he couldn't live with himself having been unable to save Bentley from losing his legs in the last game. Murray does himself no good by dwelling on this past tragedy, especially since Bentley says it to him straight. Get over it, Murray! I don't blame you, and never have! The only thing I feel bad about is losing my pal. But he still has an obligation to his teacher now, one that's shattered in his confrontation with the level's main villain, Don Octavio. The local mob boss who used to be an opera singer who got cast out of fame because rock music became more popular than what he did. Now he's gonna force everyone to listen to him whether they want to or not. Goofy cartoon setup, obviously, but the parallel is clear. Octavio is a villain purely because of his inability to accept the passage of time and changing tastes, and despite the power he now wields, he's going to use it to enact vengeance upon the masses who dare do this to him. The inability to let go of that resentment is why he is the way he is, not because people dare change tastes with the passage of time. Murray gets a shining moment by defending Bentley from this scumbag after he kicks Bentley out of his wheelchair. That does it! I'll floss my teeth with your spine! The Murray returns! The inner peace Murray was seeking was this all along, moving past the traumas of before and just doing your best now, which is why he can rejoin the gang after all is said and done. Episode 2 is the least connected here, since the goal is getting Murray's guru to join the gang, a character who only speaks gibberish that everyone miraculously understands, and the villains are tearing up his beautiful Australian landscape, so you have to help him stop them. Guess you could say the point is that change in the pursuit of selfish goals is bad, but that's about all I got. Otherwise, it's a pretty dry level in terms of story and gameplay, but then in Episode 3, you have the RC specialist Penelope, who will only join the gang if they beat her boss, the Black Baron, in a dogfight. But the truth is that Penelope is the Black Baron. She created the character to get past the Aces competition's age restrictions, and then it took off and became an icon, so she felt she needed to keep up appearances more and more as the years went on. The Cooper gang freeing her from this toxic influence in her life. The level you meet her in shows how she's fiercely loyal, and now that's going to the Cooper gang. Although, you have some tension seeing as she and Bentley basically catfished each other to get to this point. 
Episode 4 being where the themes hit the hardest because it creates a difficult situation for Sly himself. Bentley decides the only demolition expert they should seek out is the Panda King from Sly 1, but he's now a shell of a man following his defeat at the hands of Sly years ago. Sly has to grapple with the fact that this guy was on the team that killed his parents, and the Panda King equally wants nothing to do with Sly because Sly destroyed his empire. Now, obviously the story isn't saying feel bad for the Panda King because Sly stopped him from murdering people en masse. It's merely a larger plot about resentment and trauma yet again, as the Panda King's daughter was abducted by a warlord named General Sao who wants to marry her to unite the lineages of Sao and King. The writer has pulled this character back from Sly 1 to tell that story. The Panda King was always a spiteful person, that's his backstory after all, but his whole arc is coming to terms with what he's done to save his daughter and recognizing how much Sly has lost because of him and his cohorts and how Sly is able to put aside their differences, so why shouldn't he? They still aren't friends, their scenes together are intentionally awkward, but it's all in the larger story of growth and change. The conflict between the two is perfectly shown at the start of Episode 4 as the Guru manages to bridge the minds between Sly and the Panda King, King just endlessly replaying the fight he had with Sly years ago. Sly aptly saying, We both know why you're here. You're fixated on the moment of your greatest defeat. I beat you, and forever after you've wondered how it all fell apart. I hate you, Sly Cooper. You've ruined me. Ruined the Panda King. And I've hated you, but that doesn't make any of this real. Years have passed, and, and we've both changed. Come out of this trance. Let's meet each other as we are today, and, and let go of who we were when this fight occurred. You are correct. Forgive me, my mind is not always my own. Leading to Sao as a character. He's just the worst of the worst, a total scumbag and someone forcing Jing King to marry him, uttering this line to really drive it home how he's got no decency whatsoever. But she doesn't want to marry you. She's a woman. She doesn't know up from down. Once I convinced her father to take up meditation, she was ripe for the picking. I faced a lot of bad men in my time, but you, sir, are the worst. He's also obsessed with status and lineage, him thinking Sly is a good adversary because of his own family history. But again, Sly says it succinctly. It's not about the family name, pal. It's what you do with it. By this point in the game, its themes are pretty clear. The heroes and villains are all defined by an opportunity for change. The heroes always take it and grow from it, and the villains don't, falling deeper into cycles of tradition and resentment. Which naturally leads to a discussion on our three main characters and the final boss of Sly 3, Dr. M. Bentley's whole arc in Sly 3 concludes what his character has been about since Sly 1, coming out of his shell, which he did do in Sly 2, but was set back a bit because of what happened to him in that game. However, he comes back stronger than ever, leading the mission to rescue Penelope from Captain Lafui in Episode 5, resolving the romantic tension between them that's been building since Episode 3. Throughout all this, Sly's been pretty static, watching everyone around him change, doing so partially because of his positive influence. Which brings us right back to where we started. Getting crushed to death in the fist of some genetics experiment gone wrong. Not the way I thought I'd go out. Here I am at the end, and suddenly all I can think about is what a coward I've been towards Carmelita. Sly has had this game of cat and mouse with Carmelita go on for years at this point, and in his dying moments, all he can think about is how he should have just given up on this legacy of trouble and just be honest with himself and Carmelita, who turns up to save him from the monster attack. But really though, the Cooper legacy has, at this point, brought nothing but pain. Clockwork had that burning hatred for the Coopers that caused him to become immortal to attack them generation after generation, Sly fighting back and getting the Thievius Raccoonus restored. But then we see how much pain was brought upon the entire team trying to destroy Clockwork and Sly too, not just Sly himself. The Cooper legacy has brought this upon them, and now that Sly has restored the book and killed Clockwork for good, why are we still doing this? Sly fully realized that in what he thought were his final moments. A scene that I thought was pretty intense when I first played this game however many years ago. Fun fact, if you die as Carmelita in this boss fight, the game over screen is Sly getting eaten by the monster. That's an image I'm not going to forget. Once you actually get inside the Cooper Vault, it's empty. Filled with enough wealth to last 10 lifetimes, but at what cost to each of these people as individuals? It's almost haunting in a way, rather than satisfying to see as the place is filled with nothing but death traps. The Cooper legacy is nothing but a cobweb-ridden den, one that's filled with more money than you could ever imagine, but is this a legacy worth leaving behind? Sly's father's portrait's even cut off, this level showing us that the man was so powerful that he'd mastered the ability to walk on lasers, but nobody will ever know because the Cooper legacy is one of misery and isolation. While Sly has great reverence for his lineage, he's starting to realize this fact as well. Backed by the music that plays here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dr. M, the villain, is the epitome of everything this game's villains are trying to say. It's revealed that he was the brains of Sly's father's gang, and he's been at Kane Island trying to bust into the Cooper Vault for over a decade and has gone completely insane. Only because he hated Sly's father so much and felt entitled to the Cooper fortune. Even though you can imagine, he must have already had quite a lot to finance this operation in the first place. Once more, this endless resentment is central to the story. Bentley's final arc is a bit contentious in the fanbase, as many think Bentley started to question Sly at the last minute as out of nowhere. Do you ever feel like you're playing second fiddle to Sly? But I actually feel like the whole story was building up to it, as Penelope almost fell for Sly, causing Bentley to feel a little bit like all his efforts never get seen. So when Dr. M says this to Sly, Then why is it called the Cooper Gang, you self-centered egomaniac? It causes Bentley to think about it. But Murray snaps him out of it. Think of it this way, Bentley. If it were you in that vault and Sly and I were out here, what would he do? Stop these thugs and protect his friend. Right, and that's what I'm gonna do! This Cooper gang won't be like the last one and keep this never-ending miserable cycle going. These guys are brothers and are gonna fight like it. Leading to the final battle where Sly, who is all about growth and change, comes face to face with Dr. M, who is the antithesis. The game ends with Sly getting the chance to make things right with Carmelita and he takes it, faking amnesia as a way to start over. But as Bentley says in the ending, Dr. M refused to leave the vault that was crumbling around him. He'd spent his life lusting over the Cooper fortune. And he wasn't going to give it up, no matter what the cost. Dying alone with nothing but his hatred at his side. Did him a lot of good, right? Sly 3 set out to give the series a satisfying payoff, as all three of our main characters finally decided to just move on with their lives. Bentley and Penelope using their genius for scientific pursuits, Murray going all in on his driving and mechanic skills, and Sly living life with Carmelita. I spent all this energy on how Sly 3 is a story about making positive change, because it truly is the core DNA of the plot. Everything the game was about in both its serious characters and its comedic ones is building up to this ending. If everything I just laid out was actually a massive coincidence, I'd be stunned. Because Sucker Punch knew this was their last Sly Cooper game. They wanted to wrap up the trilogy in a satisfying way before exploring other franchises. I think the ending is about the characters as much as it is about the studio who made them. I said the story of Sly was linked to the people who made it in the Sly 1 video and that fact has come to the forefront now. Bentley makes sure to mention in the ending that he holds his time with Sly and Murray dear to his heart, but there's strength in moving forward. Which was the attitude of the studio at the time. While it's fun to live and, uh, and stay with your uh, family, you know, it's useful to move and it's useful to go somewhere new and have new experiences. And I think that was uh, something that we were pretty clear on, that we knew we were going to do Sly 3 and then we were going to go do uh, new IP. It was great fun working on Sly and growing so much as a team and getting all the letters from the young fans who played Sly, but when you've said all there is to say, it's good to branch out and try new things. This being a lesson that unfortunately fell on deaf ears for the audience of the game. I mean, it's a story about letting go of and accepting the past and moving forward in a game made for like eight-year-olds. We were not going to get it at the time. But of course, Sucker Punch wasn't trying to end Sly forever with this game. They just wanted to end their time with the series on a satisfying high note. But they left the door open in the hopes another developer would take the reins and keep growing the Sly IP. Literally! Cause I'm building a time machine to find out! This time travel sequel hook being the thing that most of the community became obsessed with, rather than just enjoying the ride it took to get to this point. I don't have to tell any longtime viewers that I've had quite the history with Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, which was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2013. For right now, I'm not going to use this opportunity to disparage that game, as at the time, I and many fans were over the moon for more Sly content. And as of today, I don't think Sly 4 is some terrible game. It's alright, it's good fun at its best. Terribly written at worst. But the reason I bring it up is that as the years have gone on since that game was released with its cliffhanger ending, I just look back and see the ending of Sly 3 for what it is. The ending of these characters. Sly 3 was all about moving on, trying to achieve more out of life. That's what I see in Sly 3. It makes sense that the young audience didn't get what it was going for back in 2005, and it was nice to see the crew again in Sly 4 as sort of a reunion show. And I would love to see Sly one last time in a remade trilogy like Crash and Spyro got a few years back. However, I think we, as in all the members of the Sly community, should just accept that Sly 3 ended the way it did and that was on a good note. I'm not saying to hate Sly 4, don't twist my words. I mean that in the years since the ending of Sly 4, fans have desperately clawed in every imaginable way in the hopes of getting a Sly 5, when I think that desperation just shows that a deeper understanding of Sly 3 was never reached. If Sly 5 or a remake, reboot, or whatever happens, I'm there day one, but if not, 
I'm also content just enjoying the content we had instead of endlessly begging for more of it, holding on to this resentment of newer, more popular games like Don Octavio himself. I think more people are coming around to this idea with each passing year, seeing as it's now been longer between Sly 4 and the present day than it was going from Sly 3 to Sly 4. And as the ultimate expression of understanding, I'll follow my own advice. As has been made clear a couple times now, this is my third time reviewing the Sly Cooper trilogy. It's almost a meme how I'm always going to keep coming back to these games again and again, but honestly, I think this should be and will be where it ends. In a few months, I'll be back to talk about Sly Cooper Thieves in Time again for its 10th anniversary, but if we don't get a new game, I think it's time for me to stop past that point. A big talking point I was planning on bringing up in this video was that in the years that I haven't been regularly covering Sly like I used to, I've started to share the sentiment that Sly 1 is the most replayable game in the series and that the gameplay structure of Sly 2 and onward is fundamentally flawed and that it provides almost no challenge whatsoever. I do think a new Sly game should make some changes to the formula, making it a little more challenging than it currently is. I mean, Sly jumping and pressing the circle button has a 0% chance of failure, it's just not that satisfying to do but I am more self-aware than that now. Sly 2 and 3 might not be as hard as Sly 1, but I find them to be so easy because I've played these games a million times. If I had to guess how many times I've played the Sly Cooper trilogy games combined, I think the number might break into the 70s or 80s. It's gotta be a total of 30 times across all three games in the history of this YouTube channel alone. Of course I don't find much challenge in these games. I've seen it a gazillion times. But then I think back to when I was a kid. I got my butt kicked by the boss fights of these games. Me and a bunch of other kids in my family's Super Bowl party spent forever trading the controller back and forth trying to get through that Bentley mission with the RC chopper on the train in Sly 2. I died over and over on these biplane missions. It took me a while to get past the gunner minigames in Sly 2 and 3. My sister and I could barely comprehend the treasure map mission in Sly 3, so our mom had to help out in deciphering them. These were challenging games for a kid, and that's pretty much how it was designed. They were meant to be games you didn't have to be a gaming veteran to play, but would still have some challenge. The truth is, in my love of Sly, I simply ran the games into the ground. I will replay these games hoping to feel the same magic I used to, and it's not that I got older, it's just that I played them so many times to the point where the magic is gone. I'd have to go a very long time without playing these games again for them to feel fresh. While games like Resident Evil 2 Remake or Mega Man X were designed for that endless replayability, I don't think Sly was. So it's that fact that made it so that for these videos, I was completely on autopilot during Sly 2 and Sly 3. Now, am I being negative? No, I'm just reflecting. It all happened because Sly 4's announcement inspired me to keep replaying the games over and over again so I'd be a master of the series in time for the new game. That didn't do the game any favors, gotta say. But then, out of hate for Sly 4, I'd keep replaying the games over and over, and then I started doing YouTube and did the same thing. And that's pretty much how we end up here. I haven't played The Last of Us that many times because I knew I just didn't want to ruin the game for myself like I had done with Sly. Again, I don't use the word ruin to say I don't like Sly. I don't regret putting that time in. I love that I can quote these memorable lines till the moon turns blue. I'm just saying that I think it's time that I myself learned that lesson that Sly 3 was teaching. I've been in this quest to do the perfect Sly videos for years. Now, I have videos I can look back on and say, yeah, this was good enough. And I think that's a natural point to just stop. In five years, borrowing a new game or whatever, there won't be a need for me to come back and make all these same points again, only done in whatever style I've adopted by that point because I've said everything I need to say about this series, especially by the end of my 10 years later on Thieves in Time. So it's better off that I just accept that fact and move on. Not away from Sly, but towards other things because it will always be with me. And thankfully, I've seemingly inspired a lot of other people to try it too. The comments section has revealed that my videos on Sly and my constant quotes from the series and other videos has piqued the curiosity of the audience who had never tried it and the ones who have really liked it. That's something for me to be proud of. I've spread the love of Sly Cooper to more people who can play and replay the games to get the joy I've gotten out of them now that I have admittedly run it into the ground myself. So speaking for myself, I'm going to keep talking about Sly whenever relevant in videos because this franchise will never stop being important to me. It'll never not be a source of unforgettable memories and moments. The highs and the lows, the heroic moments, funny moments, or even sad ones. I remember me and my sister reenacting the lemonade bar scene in Sly 3. And there was no way I didn't wet the bed that night. Or how we used to play the cops in robbers mode from the multiplayer again and again. I was the kind of kid who would turn off the console before letting the screen say that I lost. That kind of stuff. It may be a long time before I play these games again. I may go over a lot of this same conclusion grounded in my Thieves in Time video, but all I can say for now is just that the Sly Cooper trilogy is one of my favorite things to ever exist. Whether I play them all the time or only once every few years going forward, and that's all that really matters. And I'm glad I've gotten the chance to paint that picture one last time. So to close the video, I'll say what I always do. 
Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.